8.35. This is Breakfast with Stephen and Ellie. Sorry, my chair is so squeaky. Is, is that you? Yes, yeah, sorry. We need, honestly, we need WD-40 in this place like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. It's Get on your hands and knees, wouldn't you? And WD-40 open chair. I had to fix a chair earlier on today, didn't I? Because a leg had fallen off. He is a fixer-upper. He's very, very good. In the makeup room, in, in fact. In the makeup room. She was like, get on your knees and fix this chair. And he did it. Right. Well, let's go through Sunday's headlines. And joining us to do that is editor of Spiked Online, Tom Slater, and the author, Nikki Hodgson. Good morning to morning. both of you. Good morning. And Nikki, we're going to start in the Telegraph uh, with pregnant women on small boats. Uh, they could get special status. Yeah, so there's been lots of debate, obviously, in the Commons and then in the Lords about the illegal migration bill. It's now in the Lords, and the Lords are currently, well, blocking it, I suppose. And one of the reasons they are doing is because um, there's no exemption for pregnant women and how long they're detained when they arrive in Britain under this new law. So traditionally, in the uh, 2016 Immigration Act, there was a clause that said you couldn't hold a pregnant woman for longer than uh, 72 hours. And um, they haven't... They, they, they haven't actually mirrored that as of yet. Mm. And what they are debating is that because the, the Lords are saying, well, it's inhumane on all levels to all people, maybe if they uh, add that clause and say, well, OK, we will make sure that pregnant women are better treated, then it might pass through the Lords. So basically, pregnant women are kind of being used as, um, I don't know, they've been used to appease the Lords to get this bill through. Yeah. The thing is, the Lords are so adamant that it's inhumane on all levels to they all people. They just don't mind it being inhumane to some people. If well, women get well to this is the... Well, I, if, the Lords go, if the Lords go for it, that's the point. You know, it's what, it's what the government is trying to get through. I mean, it, I have kind of mixed feelings about this because, you know, I don't actually think... I mean, I've just been pregnant. I've just had my baby. She's 12 weeks old. And it's true that when you are pregnant, you do feel very vulnerable. And, and you are vulnerable because, you know, there's two of you, basically. And you're at risk of all kinds of different illnesses and distressful situations. And, you know, if, some, if a pregnant woman gets very ill or, you know, how, you know loses the baby in, in kind of like custody or in your time, it's ex I mean, the, the ramifications well, are absolutely aw awful. But on the other hand, I don't think that my life was worth more at that, po at that point than anybody else's just because I was pregnant. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I suppose I don't really see why the Lords would accept it. And if they do, we'll more fool them, in my opinion, because if they are having a backbone and saying we don't think it's humane for anyone, then they shouldn't, they shouldn't go along with this. Yeah. Tom, what do you make of that? Well, I think the tricky situation here is that when the Lords are meddling with anything like this, they're going to be a bit more circumspect because they don't want to be seen to be standing in the way of the elected House of Commons. So it's the sort of thing where, again, they're going to want to find a way to do this in such a way that again, allows them to sort of flex the muscles, but also doesn't interfere too much because that's when you can get in a lot of trouble. I mean, it's been interesting actually to see the level of at least rhetorical opposition. I mean, you saw the Archbishop of Canterbury getting involved in the past week and so on. And that's a very difficult and bad position for the laws to be in. If they're seen as opposing what is a flagship policy of the elected government, that's that's not something that which is going to bear out well for them, I don't think, especially with a lot of conversations around, you know, but the point of being in the laws is if you really do object to something, then you have the power mm -hmm. to do to do so. I mean, that's got to be your, your kind of moral backstop, hasn't, hasn't it, if you're in that position? Well, I, th I think that's, that's, at the same time, I can understand why people would make that argument. But it, again, if you're talking about an unelected chamber, and I don't like this piece of legislation either, I should point out. Yeah, I just yeah. don't think this is something which um, people who are there by dint of them being a bishop or being a party flunky for enough years, or that or the handful of her hereditaries are still left. And across the piece, I think it's just an untenable situation, particularly given the fact that immigration is... Uh, it's not the main issue in the country right now, but it is a big issue. It's an issue that the Conservative Party have been returned to government time and time again to tackle. And so if you're in a situation where, again, the sort of great and good unelected set are trying to interfere, it's just, uh, from a democratic standpoint, regardless of how you feel about this piece of legislation, I think it's a bad thing. And then the thing I would say about the Archbishop of Canterbury is that, you know, he's there to, you know, kind of care for people. He's got a pastoral role in society in general. So whether you elect him or not, you can see, you know, the value he has in, in offering a kind of moral position. Mm. Yeah, it's an, inter it's an interesting one. Mm. Should I get you going. Have you, your thoughts on that this morning? Um, can we have a look at the sun on Sunday, Tom? Mm. Um, the, it's when it comes to shopping mm -hmm. and things. I mean, whole cost of living crisis, basically. It's those who are poorer off who are worst affected. No, completely. I mean, that's always the story. But I think this is an interesting one, as far as it demonstrates just how much more exposed people can be at the lower end of the income scale because of the fact that whilst we've all been seeing those food prices shooting up, continuing to do so. In fact, it's the the budget lines that all of every supermarket has. Um, 
they are rising by 25% year on year. In comparison to generally speaking, it's much lower. You're talking about, about 13% in most foodstuffs. There's some particular horror stories here, but that's the sort of average. And it's just a reminder that obviously um, people poorer people, working class people are going to be more exposed anyway by dint of having less disposable income, having less money put away. But there's even um, these kinds of particular areas where they are particularly exposed given the fact that they were, in many cases, will have been buying these products to begin with anyway. They haven't switched to these out of a way of sort of cutting back. So as you say, Steve, it's just another reminder of how extra exposed... Do we know why this is happening? Is it, is it that, I mean, with some of these brands, are they lost leaders for supermarkets? And that's why they're maybe having to hike the prices. It, surely it's not... Surely it's not just taking advantage. I, I, don't, I don't think it is taking advantage. I imagine it's the sort of case that whereas some of the producers of some of the big brands, they talk about, you know, Heinz, Beans and so on, where they haven't been able to... I imagine they can just absorb these margins when it comes to those sorts of products, whereas you can't at this other end of the scale. So I don't think it's necessarily kind of mass profiteering or anything like that. Yeah. But at the same time, it is difficult because even though the wholesale price is starting to come down, that's not feeding through yet. No. And so it's people are really starting to wonder when some of this, some of the pain is going to be relieved at this point. Mm, yeah. Nikki, you've got a story in the mail today about sunbed shops. Yeah, so it's a mail investigation, which they do do from time to time, and they're pretty good, actually, depending on what they take on. But this is about uh, the fact that lots of sunbed shops in the UK are letting in uh, under-18s, sometimes under-16s, and they're kind of colluding with TikTok because they're advertising using uh, hashtags like TanTok to target younger people that shouldn't be allowed to go to the shops. There are very strict rules around tanning shops. If you've yeah. never been to one, you know, you've got to show your ID. And... Um, you know, they kind of the, the reporter basically went to several and tried it out. And you know, more than half of the salons didn't ask for the ID. Um, the cell assistants were pushing things. They knew they were, they, there was kind of an inference that they were underage. They sort of knew it. Four out of six of the shops they visited allowed in the 16-year-old that they tried to get in. You know, it just means that you know the regulation isn't working. But there's kind of a broader question here that you know, gosh, I remember growing up you know, sort of in the 80s, and some suntan shops were kind of popular then. And we all thought they were going to die out, especially as we developed these very good fake tans that you can buy. Um, and we know more about the, the ramifications, uh, which basically, you know, getting cancer. Mm. I don't really understand why we have them anymore. I know that people feel, there's a lot, I mean, there are certain skin conditions that benefit from it. I understand that. But apart from that, for the majority of people, I don't, isn't it just time to get rid of them all together? Because other countries have done it. Australia, for example, which is obviously a leader when it comes to thinking about, you know, skincare and cancer. Answer. I don't know why we don't just ban them. Yeah, I'm yeah. totally with you, Nikki. Totally with you. I fake it till I make it. So one of these, I'm a I'm, but as part, <laughs> part of these investigations and things, and and the, on TikTok and various users, one wrote, um, "I'd rather die hot than live ugly." Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, what? I mean, I know, I know, yeah. the young think they're going to live forever. Yeah. I mean, how stupid is that? Well, it's just depressing, isn't it, thinking that? That you'd just rather be miserable, unhappy, and potentially have cancer than be attracted by your standards. It's such a warped mindset, isn't it, is that you need to be tanned to, to be attracted? Yeah, no, it's, it's, and it's such a kind of strange situation when you see so much sort of focus being put on that. But I guess these are always going to be the kind of outliers, the crazy cases, whatever. But again, if you're talking about something which has an age restriction on it by law, that not being enforced is obviously going to be... A big problem because we all know about the consequences of tanning salons and so on but if it's an adult making that choice i think that's the sort of that's the arrangement that we've come to so if that's not being enforced that's got to be cracked is it out, ridiculous though it always it's fashion it's fashion to have a tan mm. basically it was always the fashion to be very pale that's why where, where posh comes from isn't it being posh yes because you don't look like you've been in the fields oh, all day bought out start <laughs> yeah. at home so these, oh, yes, that's what okay, they used yeah. to do on the boats so go stay on the port side out starboard side home so you don't get the sun yeah, but also, like, you know, I don't know. In Roman times, you had to be pale because otherwise it looked like you worked in the fields if you had yeah. a tan. So it's like, it's just fashion that comes around. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Tom, you've got a story in the Star about fry-ups. Yes. Again. Food. So this is, no, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm starving, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's a story here about, essentially, other countries around the world's attempts at a full English. And no, they can't do it. Just it can't wrong. even make a cup of tea. Exactly. Never mind a full English. This is a problem. And some, some of the images we're talking about here, I'm not sure if we've got them on screen, but, you know, we've got an American attempt which seems to have a sort of steak next to um, the usual kind of eggs and so on. We've oh, got yeah. an attempt here from, from Venezuela which seems to have a sort of avocado, what looks like a sort of plantain 
some kidney beans. It's all gone horrendously wrong here. So, I mean, uh, you know, on social media, you don't have to go far for them. It's basically a banana, isn't it? Or something similar to a banana. Exactly. It's Why is that a banana with a fry up? It's all gone terrible. Oh, Lord. Is that chili con carne? Look, I, oh, look at what camera do you want this on? <laughs> Can't hear anybody. No. But that's just, that, look at that. It looks like a large chili con carne in the middle of that one. <laughs> And I don't know. No, exactly. And the ones, what and there's rice as well. Yeah, well, on that what one. What country is that, Kenya? That's America, the oh, one with the rice, gosh. yeah. Someone... I mean, honestly, that's disgusting. Do you know what? When I went to the US, I was in Miami, and I went to get beans, because I'm a Brit, you know, you need beans with your breakfast. And they were, like, infused with, sh like, brown sugar. They were oh, really sweet. Oh, and I had sweet, sickly yeah. beans on my fry-up. It was awful. Absolutely awful. You can't do it. According to this Ukraine... Is, gets the fry up exactly right. Do they? Yeah, of oh, all these other go. countries. So that oh, kinship is there, even on the even on the full English front. It certainly is. And very quickly, Nikki, we've got one minute. The Pope's cross with people loving their pets too much. Well, no, a, a woman asked him to bless her dog, and he said, there's so many children in the world that me care, and you bring me this little dog. That's nearly v v v what he said. Um, why can't you bless everything if, you know, it's a life and you love it? I don't understand the point. I think, the, I think his issue was that she said, can you bless my child? And the child no. and the child turned out oh, to be. Oh, okay. Yeah. Important, very important. There. Try to trick. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Which is why he's, he's, why he's then gone on to say. Thou um, have more. That more makes more healthy. sense. That yeah. makes more sense. But you know, the Pope doesn't have any children. It's all right for him to tell everyone else to have them. It doesn't make any sense. No. Well. Well, this is the point Stephen made yesterday. It is the point <laughs> I made. He, do, he doesn't know what he's asking. No. <laughs> <laughs> and he's never going to have to deal with the consequences himself. So no. Apart from all the blessings he's going to do when all these kids are here. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Bored of that soon enough. Well, here's another one. Here's another one. Um, no, well, look, I don't know. Not to, not to mock his holiness, but it's just, There you go. Well, Timmy's my. Well, I don't Would think you want to get Timmy blessed? No. Oh. He's blessed enough. He lives with us. He's yeah. alive and right. it's, like, it's like he's won the lottery. He gets better health care than we do. Yeah. Anything wrong with him is straight down the vet. <laughs> Get seen the same day. Yeah. Honestly. Um, he's look, blessed enough. He's blessed enough. <laughs> uh, good to see you both this morning. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed.